Good afternoon, and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kurlukovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com. The Treaty of Lausanne officially settled numerous conflicts that had originally existed between the Ottoman Empire and the Allies since the onset of World War I. It was signed after a seven-month conference at Palais du Rumina at Lausanne, Switzerland, on July 24, 1923, by representatives of the Grand National Assembly in Ankara on one side and by Britain, France, Italy, Japan, Greece, Romania, and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes on the other. The treaty recognized the boundaries of the modern state of Turkey. The Allies dropped their demands of autonomy for a Turkish Kurdistan and Turkish cession of territory to Armenia, which was already under Soviet rule, abandoned all capitulations and claims to spheres of influence in Turkey and imposed no controls over Turkey's finances or armed forces. Turkey, in return, made no claims to its former Arab provinces and recognized British possession of Cyprus and Italian possession of the Dodecanese. The Turkish straits between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea were declared open to all shipping. This section of the Lausanne Treaty was later updated with the Montreux Convention signed on July 20th, 1936. The Lausanne Treaty was the result of a second attempt at peace after the stillborn and never, rat never ratified 1920s Treaty of Sèvres, which aimed to ruthlessly divide the vast Ottoman lands and shrink even the Turkish homeland for a millennium Anatolia to a tiny sliver of itself. Unspeakable atrocities committed by the Greek army and its local proxies immediately following the May 15, 1919 Greek invasion of Izmir under British encouragement and support ignited the Turkish War of Independence. The next day, Mustafa Kemal Pasha and some of his close group of comrades in arm left on board the now famous boat called Bandurma and landed in Samsun on May 19, 1919. The case, the date, considered the start of the Turkish independence war. Acceptance of the incredibly humiliating terms of the Treaty of Sèvres on August 10, 1920 by the representatives of the beaten and practically defunct Ottoman Empire only made matters worse by solidifying the Turkish resolve to liberate at all costs the homeland from all foreign invaders. The Turks, exhausted and left limited limited resources by the Balkan Wars and World War I stunned the Western world by decisively winning a series of lengthy and bloody battles and driving the Greek invaders to the sea at Izmir on September 9, 1922. Thanks in no small part to the military brilliance and resolute leadership of Mustafa Kemal Pasha. Local proxies like some Ottoman Greeks and some Ottoman Armenians who had joined the Greek invaders in committing war crimes and hate crimes against Turks and feared retaliations also left Western Anatolia with the fleeing Greek armies. As a result of Greco-Turkish war, Izmir was retrieved and Armistice of Mudanya was signed uh, on October 11, 1922. It provided for the Greek-Turkish population exchange and allowed unrestricted civilian passage through the Turkish Straits. This narrative sort of summarizes the essence of the Lausanne Treaty. 
Now that we know when, where, and by whom it was signed, perhaps we can explore it in a bit more detail and try to understand its achievements, significance, and impact. A prominent Turkish diplomat and an expert on international, international law, Gündüz Aktan opined in his essay titled The Lausanne Peace Treaty and the Armenian Question this way. The Lausanne Treaty is an important international contact with a vast scope of subject areas it covers that was negotiated, signed and ratified by almost all important participants of the First World War. It covers political, military, economic and humanitarian issues that relates to the Eastern Front of the First World War in general and Ottoman Empire in specific with a wide-ranging ramifications for third countries. Professor Sevtab Demirci of the Atatürk Institute for Modern History of Boğaziçi University, Istanbul, Turkey, covered this subject in detail in her white paper titled From Serv to Lausanne, the Armenian Question. 1920 to 1923. To summarize, from the mid-19th century until the beginning of the First World War, the Ottoman Empire was called the sick man of Europe. It faced numerous crises, doubling, troubling the empire, most of which resulted in the loss of vast territories along with their inhabitants. The Eastern question, which meant the question of what should happen to the Ottoman Empire, changed its character drastically after the defeat in the Balkan Wars of the Ottoman Empire. With the downfall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I, the Armenian issue in Anatolia was brought to the forefront at most diplomatic forums. With the Serb Treaty, the Allies eventually gave the Armenian nationalists most of what Armenians demanded at Turkey's cost to reward Armenians for fighting on the side of the Allies. Decisive Turkish nationalist victories against the Armenians in the East and the Greeks in the West made the Serb Treaty a stillborn document. This compelled the Allies to meet the triumphant Turks on equal terms at Lausanne the text of which did not contain any reference at all to an Armenian state or a national home. Thus, the Lausanne Treaty put an end to the centuries-old Eastern question as well as its integral part, the Armenian question. Any demands for altering it or terminating it must be met with suspicion. This is especially valid for demands that are not based on any principles embodied in the treaty or contravene the general principles of the international law. Thus, any subjectively motivated claims regarding this treaty, especially those of the Republic of Armenia and the Armenian diaspora, rooted in the events of 1915, must be viewed skeptically. Lausanne Treaty was concluded within the framework of the Lausanne Conference. The Allies issued an invitation to Turkey to attend the Lausanne Conference for the purpose of bringing full peace to the East. It was signed after the conclusion of two parts. The first part was held between November 21st, 1922 and February 4th, 1923. The second part was held between the dates of April 23rd 1923 and July 24th, 1923. The major discussants and inviting states were Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. The observing states were Greece, the Serb Croat Slovan state, Romania, and the United States. When border issues were discussed, then Soviet Russia and Bulgaria were invited. And when tri trade and residency issues were on the table, then countries like Belgium and Portugal were brought in. Upon persistent demands and numerous letters and notes of reminders by Armenians, whom the Turks would not allow at the table, 
The events of 1915 were discussed but no direct references to Armenians or the Republic of Armenia were permitted in the text of the Lausanne Treaty. This is significant since the Turkish-Armenian conflict had been a concern in the waning years of the Ottoman Empire. The events of 1915 have been thoroughly discussed both during the negotiation phase and the writing phase of the treaty text. During the negotiations, the problems related to the events of 1915 were dealt with directly. During the writing, though, they treated the same subject indirectly. One issue concerning the events of 1915 was Armenian territorial demands. The Allied powers brought it up on several occasions. The Minority Subcommission meeting held on December 14, for example, was one such occasion. The Allies wanted a detailed discussion of a national homeland for the Armenians that would start the next day, which is December 15th. The meeting on December 14th, however, ended at an impasse. According to the minutes of the meetings, the Turkish representative informed the Allied representatives that the Turkish delegation would not allow such a discussion to take place. The Allied representatives, comprising of British, French and Italian members, insisted on the discussions on this matter to go forward. They furthermore demanded that Turkey, instead of refusing to discuss the issue, should present counter-arguments to convince the Commission the Turkish representative argued that the issue had been resolved in the prior treaties, namely the Treaty of Alexandropol of 1920, the Treaty of Moscow 1921, and the Treaty of Kars in 1921. Professor Tron informs us on pages from 219 to 222 in his book titled The Armenian Question at the Lausanne Peace Talks, that the initial discussion for a national homeland for Armenians ended on December 18th, but in the draft proposal that was accepted as the basis of further negotiations, the question of Armenian homeland was not included. The Allies continued their efforts to raise the issue of an Armenian homeland. In fact, an Armenian delegation was invited to the meeting of the subcommission on December 26th. Turkish representatives objected strenuously to this invitation on two grounds. First, the Turks argued that any delegation desired to be invited to the subcommission meetings must secure a unanimous decision first. That didn't happen. Second, an Armenian delegation could only be heard if all the Muslim and non-Muslim minorities residing in Romania, Serbia, and Greece could send a delegation to the subcommission meeting also. That didn't happen. Furthermore, the Turks argued that in the context uh, put forth by the Allies, the Commission also needed to grant a hearing to the delegations of Muslim nations under Allied powers occupation as well as an Irish delegation. Despite these reasonable objections of the Turkish representatives, the Allies on the subcommission listened to an Armenian delegation on December 26 anyway. The Turkish delegation refused to participate in this meeting, which was not included in the minutes of the conference, due to the illogical and justified absence of Turkish representatives. That session, therefore, lacked any official standing. The pressure on the Turks continued with the declaration made by the American delegation regarding a homeland for the Armenians on December 30th, and these issues would not be discussed again by the subcommission. 
The attempts at including the Armenian delegation to the Lausanne Conference and discussing issues related to the events of 1915 produced no results. By the end of the conference, Turks and allies considered the subject matter of Armenian homeland closed. Although dealt with indirectly in the text of the Lausanne Treaty, issues related to the Armenian population arising from the temporary resettlement or Tereset of Armenians in 1915-1916 were thoroughly covered. One of the issues that has been dealt with indirectly in the text of Lausanne Treaty is, is the future of displaced individuals because of the First World War. The treaty ensures that no individual who had been displaced was left without a nationality or citizenship. In Article 30 of the treaty, for example, it is stated that the Turkish subjects customarily residence in territories which, in accordance with the provisions of the present-day treaty, are detached from Turkey will become ipso facto nationals of the state to which such territory is transferred. And Article 30 ensures that any individual who was left outside the acknowledged borders of the Lausanne Treaty would automatically, automatically gain the nationality of the country in which they, they were residing at the signing of the Lausanne Treaty. It is further added in Article 31 that persons over 18 years of age losing their Turkish nationality and obtaining ipso facto a new nationality under Article 30 shall be entitled within a period of two years from the coming into force of the present treaty to opt for Turkish nationality. Thus, Article 31 states plainly that any individual who had acquired a new nationality at the signing of the treaty would have the right to regain Turkish nationality. A second issue that has been dealt with indirectly in the text of the Lausanne Treaty is about the immovable property of the displaced individuals. It is stated in Article 33 that persons who have ex ex exercised the right to opt in accordance with the provisions of Articles 31 and 32 must, within the succeeding 12 months, transfer their place of residence to the state for which they have opted. They will be entitled to retain their immovable property in the territory of the previous state where they had their place of residence before exercising their right to opt. There are 18 documents in the Lausanne Treaty. The issue of immovable property of the displaced individual has been dealt with in the eighth document called the Amnesty Declaration. There, for instance, under Article 6, it is stated that the Turkish government, which shares the desire for general peace with all the Allied powers, announces that it will not object to the measures implemented between 20th of October 1918 and 20th of November 1922 in occupied Istanbul, with the intention of bringing back together the families which were separated because of the war and of returning possessions to their rightful owners. Prominent Turkish diplomat and scholar of international law, Pulat Tajar, and French historian, Dr. Maxime Gain, inform us on page 832 of their white paper called State Identity, Continuity and Responsibility, that Article 33 further states that efforts by the Allied forces could hinder any individual from reapplying to the proper authorities regarding their ownership of rights of their properties. According to the U.S. archives, 644,900 Armenians had returned to the land that is now referred to as Turkey before the signing of the Lausanne Treaty. The number of properties returned to their owners had already reached 
241,000 by 1919. This number corresponds to almost 98% of the immovable properties. A third issue that has been dealt with indirectly in the Lausanne Treaty text is about the political and military actions that were taken and commissioned between the dates of August 1st, 1914 and November 20th, 1922. The first five articles of the Amnesty Declaration deals with these issues. Articles 1 and 2, I'm sorry, 1 and 3, state that nationals or citizens or individuals residing in Turkey and Greece could not be held accountable for or be prosecuted for their political and military actions, including aiding and abetting foreign powers between the, uh, between the above mentioned dates. Article 2 states that individuals residing in countries which were separated from Turkey also could not be prosecuted for their actions between the above mentioned dates. Just like in Articles 1 and 3, these individuals were given amnesty for both political and military actions. Article 4 provides protection from prosecution to the nationals of all signatory, signatories of Lausanne Treaty for their political and military actions commissioned between the mentioned dates. On a different subject, Article 13 says, and I quote, Section 1, with a view to ensuring, ensuring the maintenance of peace, the Greek government undertakes to observe the following restrictions in, in the islands. No naval base and no fortification will be established, end quote. But unfortunately today, Greece violates this article by establishing military strike capability while uh, the US and the EU seem to look the other way. This is a grave concern for Turkey and that the threat is growing day by day. And Article 59 says this, I quote, Greece recognizes her obligation to make reparation for the damage caused in Anatolia by the acts of the Greek army or administration, which were contrary to the laws of the war, unquote. This statement alone is an international treaty. A text proves that atrocities committed by the invading Greek armies in Western Anatolia between 1919 and 1922. Article 60 says that the states in favor of which territory was detached from the Ottoman Empire after the Balkan Wars or by Lausanne Treaty, shall acquire without payment all the property and possessions of the Ottoman Empire situated therein, without payment. So, those who think that they might have a, a case, a right to claim this or that in the present day Turkey, I say, think again. Just like you may have lost some property in Turkey, Turkey lost a lot of property in the previous Ottoman lands. All of this was resolved with Lausanne Treaty, which brought peace to the region for a century. We should all cherish this and not allow anyone to destroy peace with some ill-informed and ill-advised demands. One last word. Article 60 also stipulates that disputes between the Greek and Turkish governments relating to the property and possessions in territories of the former Ottoman Empire that transferred to Greece after the Balkan Wars or thereafter shall be referred to an arbitral tribunal at The Hague. The terms of reference shall be settled between the two governments. I concur with this and support this approach, as I believe international law is the way to solve disputes if diplomacy fails, not wars. So, if Armenians want the 1915 events to be called a genocide, for example, then they should take it to the International Court of Justice, a competent tribunal established by the United Nations just for such a purpose. But I'm not holding my breath as I know 
for sure that Armenia does not dare do such a thing. Why, you ask? Well, because the courts hear the other side of the story too. Thank you for joining me. See you next week when we will scholarly explore other issues. Thank you.